I'm interested, you mentioned Cheever. His novel, Falconer, is a wonderful kind of... I thought of it a few times when reading this because of the depiction of prison and uh, his protagonist who uh, has certain things in common with Patrick. Uh, writing about prison, was that something... You, you talk about the inevitability of the crime in this book. Does that mean that from the outset you knew that you were going to have to deal with this world? Yeah, I did, I did know... Well, no, I didn't, because when I, when I started writing it in the early drafts, I didn't even know that he would be convicted. I didn't know he, he would go to prison. But Falcon is a fantastic book, and I just want to talk about it because I read that when I was about halfway through this book, and I didn't know it existed, because Cheever's not famous for his two novels, Falconer and Bullet Park. But I discovered Falconer halfway through this book, and it really um, made a mess of me. I quit writing this book because Falconer is, is it really is a, an extraordinary novel. It's, it's uh, outstanding. Um, I just felt like, um, I, 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 mean, I just felt completely redundant. If there are any writers in the audience who've had this experience, you know what the hell I'm talking about. It just felt like, Jesus, why, why do I even bother? This has been done and it's been done so well and there are parallels. And there were even, there were even more, but I had to abandon them. Um, there's a little, in Falconer, he does, uh, John Cheever does a little bit more, the, the man is in prison in Falconer, it's the whole story, is set in prison. Uh, there's a kind of um, a homosexual thing going on, and I had that, it, it was much more overt in this novel in the early drafts, and I had to pull back from it, um, only because of that stupid kind of writer um, phobia of being like someone else or too, having too many similarities with another book. Um, but yeah, and then I, I quit writing this thing because, of, because Falconer is so extraordinary. But prison, I didn't know, no, I didn't know that's where it was going to end up, but once it did, it was too late. How do you approach something like that? The boarding house is one setting, but with prison, I read in another interview that you went to a couple of prisons for, by way of research. How was that? Yeah, it was, it, they're it, awful places, really. But I, I went because um, I had... Um, in the early drafts, I don't do any research at all because I want to, to make it all up from scratch and not have e any interference from, you know, facts. <laughs> um, um, so I made it all up and I thought that I should do some fact-checking and, and see and sort myself out and, and I went to two prisons. Uh, one is quite a famous prison in Manchester where I live called Strangeways. Anybody who knows the Smith song will know um, the, the prison's name. It's now called Her Majesty's. Um, and I went there and did a writer's workshop. In, in England, and it's probably an equivalent um, organization here, um, a writer's in prison organization. And there are you know, a few dozen writers who make a living um, going into prisons and conducting workshops. So I did one of those, um, which, was, which was really um, kind of strange. But, uh, and then I found out a bunch of stuff about uh, what prisons are really like and how they really function and work. And then it sort of, it didn't suit my, dramatic purposes, so I sort of ignored it and stuck to what I had made up. Okay. Except for a few bits of uh, jargon and terminology which I got, like being on enhanced privileges in prison uh, versus basic privileges, and that I used some of that kind of terminology when, once I did the research. Because, I mean, again, that notion of, of inevitability. Once in the prison, uh, everything about Patrick's worldview and his ability to cope with the world is kind of brought into stark relief. He's suddenly in the smaller confines he's finding an environment he can cope in. Is that something that uh, you saw a lot of in the research that you ultimately rejected? Um, <laughs> no. I, that, that angle that I have here which is that he, Patrick, he says um, I think he's well into the, into the prison scenes when he says uh, he thinks life is shrinking to a size that suits him better or suits him more. And that he was an, an, um, one of the tragic ironies uh, of the story is that when Patrick is in prison, he, he gets along a little better than he did in the world. Um, uh, that was really deliberate, and I wanted to examine that. But I didn't, in, in my reading or my visits to two prisons, meet a prisoner who said, I'm happier in here. But I've, I've heard of it as a kind of, um, uh, um, not a phenomenon, but something that, happens and why people why recidivism is so high it might not be that people 
frankly, to say that they are you know, happier is a nonsense, but that they, um, it's the only life and world they know. People go back to prison, they're safe there, they're comfortable, they're surrounded by like-minded people. <laughs> they know what to talk about. And it's um, a habit, a habit of, of a lifetime. They keep going back. Recidivism is probably as high as it is for reasons much like I'm getting out here, but I have a different flavor. I haven't really thought about it that much, but yeah. The intensity of the first-person narrative, you say you've lived with Patrick for three years, he's there in your head, the, not to give anything away to those who haven't read it. I think we've given it all away it's, already. Yeah, that's right. On the last page, no, no, <gasps> it, it, is, it is left extraordinarily open. One reviewer did that. Do you know a reviewer described the last, the last oh. scene? Yeah, in The Observer. Oh. Don't, ever, don't re read The Observer ever again. Yeah. <laughs> they're, Please, they're, ever. they're all running Please. down to Tullamarine Airport to buy <laughs> copies, so... Uh, that's good. That might put a stop to it. But, uh, but you leave it uh, quite open to interpretation, whether it's a, a kind of optimistic uh, ending for Patrick or whether it's that word bleak again. How, how do you deal with it as a writer, closing the book, mm. as it were? Yeah. I find endings really, really difficult. Um, the LRB spent three pages talking about how difficult I find them. Um, the, the endings of the first two novels, are, I'm not... I'm not entirely happy with them, but the deus ex machina in the first one, suddenly something happens out of nowhere. I see it now, I didn't see it then when I was, you know, a novice, relatively speaking. Um, this, the, no, this, the ending of Carry Me Down I almost got there, but it's elliptical, and so is this one. So it's not closed off, and that's it's deliberate, but I know that I, it's a problem too. It, it will um, frustrate some people. Oh, and it is inherently frustrating that it doesn't, it's not all tied up. It's, there's, no, there's no neat conclusion. But it's, uh, there, are, there are actually, although a few people have picked up some of the possible readings of the ending, but there are four possible, there are four possible readings of the ending. Including It Was All a Dream. <laughs> That's my least favourite of the possible readings of the ending. So it sounds like you, you read a lot of uh, the reviews about your work. How, how does that affect you as a writer? Do you, yeah. do you read them? Yeah, I say I don't, but I do. You I self Google? Well, I, I've got to come clean. I, I, this is like this um, thing that I kept saying, I, I, don't, I don't read them. But I, of course I do. I mean, I've, I, there was this, I was, um, I've been, this book has divided people. And my friends say, that's a good sign. Maybe it is. But I've been savaged in some reviews. I really, really... It was a review in the Irish Times. It was like... It was so... It felt so personal. It was really... I was really savaged. And it was like being heckled by a drunk having a nervous breakdown. It was really, really sad. I know, I, you, you know Just for legal was, purposes, <laughs> and Maria's not saying the writer is a drunk, just in case you're not... She is, is saying she they're is? having a nervous breakdown. That's what, exactly what I'm saying. Oh, Okay. I stand corrected. And uh, it, was, it was a savaging, and, I, and I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't actively set out to read them. I don't read newspapers, and I don't have a TV. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a bit hermetic. I am a bit hermetic. But anyway, but the, I find out about them, because that, the day after that review, which was a savaging, um, I was, got sympathetic phone calls from friends in Ireland saying, how are you, Maria? Are you okay? Are you feeling all right? What that, why, why? And I knew, I knew, and it was like, oh, have you read it? No, I haven't read it, but oh, and then of course, you know, I, it, it's awful, it's awful. Um, Our friends are the worst, aren't they? They're just terrible, yes, the way they do that. They're not anymore. I suspect that you could, <laughs> I suspect that you could easily argue that to get a savage review like that is an indication you've arrived. And uh, no one who's read this book or either of Maria's other two could be in any doubt uh, that you're a writer of as I said, singular and rare talent. It's an extraordinary book. I am going to throw the questions from the audience. Before we do, I thought one last question from me would be, uh, are there questions that you get when you're promoting your books that you absolutely hate? <laughs> Why are you such a genius? Yeah. No, wh where do you get your ideas from? Yeah, good. You're on notice, all of you. <laughs> we don't want to hear that. You're also on notice, uh, being mindful that it's a big room and the poor volunteer has to run around with a microphone. When it comes to you, uh, could you please make sure it's a question, not a statement? Uh, question mark on the end is normally a pretty good indicator of that. And also, could you make sure it's shorter than any possible answer that you're going to receive? 
That's Sh- shorter quite than short. my answers would not be difficult. I mean, <laughs> that, that gives you 14 pages. Of You'd freedom. be surprised. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah. just put your hand up, and we will get to you with time. So, you haven't exactly put people at their ease. I know. I'm trying to scare them, but there's oh, someone look. there who's not frightened enough. And lo- I love, I love questions. I love answering questions. Thank you, uh, Marie. You mentioned that you liked Patrick, um, and I gathered you were quite attached to him. I'm just wondering, did you have trouble? Was it difficult to let go when you finished the book? Um, yep. And uh, finishing any book is really, is really difficult. I mean, it's kind of a, if nothing else, a sort of a, an addiction. It's something, I mean, I d- did nothing else but think, breathe, and shit this book for three years, you know, and then, it, then it's over. And it's not only over, and I, that, that, that world is, is done, and it's, it's dead, it's finished. And then I have to hand it over for judgment. It's really, and that, that all, that those two things together, conflated, make it a fairly um, awful time. Um, and then it's hard to, uh, when I've started the fourth novel, really hard to shake the voice of, of Patrick. And when I started this one, it was hard to shake John Egan's voice, and they're quite different voices. Have um, you identified what the fourth novel is? Yeah. Yeah, it gets worse. Wow. Much worse. Yeah. 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 Again, Much worse. not about an outsider and not miserable. <laughs> no. They would be misinterpretations. It's cheerful. <laughs> cheerful. <laughs> yeah, that, does, <laughs> that sounds so unlikely. <laughs> now, there's, there's a hand right up the back. Excellent. Oh, hi, Mary. Uh, I just wanted to Do know, know hi, <laughs> how hi. you got in, inside the, uh, um, the heads of Patrick, especially in the scene near the beginning with the two other boarders where he feels like an outsider. He's the third person. Um, Yeah, Patrick, there's an echo in the, um, throughout the book. So when Patrick was a young boy, he had two close male friends, but he always felt like the third one, the, you know, the sort of odd one out. And then he arrives at his boarding house as part of his plan to start a life anew. And there are two men in the boarding house and they're very close. And he is again the third man, the the one left out. Um, And I wanted to do something with that. That, that feeling of, in, in, a, in a friendship group, the, the person who doesn't fit, feel like they're as loved or, or fit in as well. How, how did I imagine that or how did I write that? Because I've probably experienced it in, at some level and it fascinates me. I think that even, I, I, don't, I don't even, I don't even, I feel kind of, I feel unnerved if I'm with more than one person. I don't know if anybody else ever has this. I don't um, want to just, alarm you, but uh, <laughs> there's a few. <laughs> no, you know, in terms of I- intimacy, like if you have, you know, if there's three people, there's something about that th- the three people scenario that really um, spooks me, and I want to write about it and try, ca- try and capture that. And I thought it was sort of perfect for the sort of um, particular brand of sadness that he's suffering from of never being let in or not letting himself in, arguably. I'm interested because that fits into, you know, as you say, it's a recurring kind of theme and we get glimpses of the fact that Patrick experienced that as a child, he experiences it again in jail. How much material is there, backstory, if you like, for characters that you conceive of that doesn't actually appear in the book? Um, Lots, lots, yeah. You know, in that whole that business that Hemingway talked about, the tip of the iceberg, but that the writer need only show the tip, but that the rest of the iceberg has got to be there. Otherwise, there's nothing to support the superstructure or the, the, whole, the whole business. Um, uh, the, this, is, this is twice as many words in, in the early drafts, and then I just take it all away. Uh, but it, it, it's still there, the sort of the imprint or the... Uh, there's another word I'm looking for and I can't find. I must be nervous, you see. I'm not usually so inarticulate. There's almost an echo there's of it. There's an echo of it, yeah. There's a, there's a shade of it, there's a shadow of it. But it has to be there. I have to know what it is. So there's a whole lot of biographical stuff about characters, past events, and uh, I need to know where everybody has been, where they come from, where they're going. I need to know all that stuff, but it can't be there. I thought we were asking... We are, but, you know, I've got a microphone and they don't (laughs) yet. But there's another hand down here, so we might just come to that. 
I've actually got two questions. One is, would you comment on, please, on the uh, Nietzsche quote at the beginning of the novel? And secondly, and this is... Um, um, I'm a little unsure of this, but you said you don't see yourself as a short story writer. I read a memoir you wrote, you included in, a, in Mianjin some years ago, that to me, in fact, read like a profoundly moving short story. That is, it seems to me mm, that, n that that writing of memoir material there is in fact the kind of stuff of really fine short stories such as, for example, Peter Carey's drawn on in his early short stories of, um, um, for example, the American story. So that's... Oh, so how can I make that a question? Would you reread your memoir <laughs> published in Mianjin and think, is this like the beginning of really moving short stories? Uh-huh, okay. Um... Everything unconditional, the, um, everything unconditional belongs in pathology is the quote from Nietzsche at the beginning of this book. I mean, that, that sort of stuff we were talking about earlier, um, uh, about my kind of attempt here to, to have all that's in here morally complex and amorphous and difficult to kind of um, pathologize or sum up or roll up into a, a nice neat ball in terms of cause and effect. So that, that quote seemed absolutely perfect. The only thing, the unconditional belongs in pathology is the only thing certain is, is death, everything else is conditional, and everything else depends on everything else. That kind of messiness um, is, is in here. Um, as for the, I've written uh, occasionally some memoir stuff. It's not anything like the kind of short stories I'd like to be able to write. I mean, it's sort of like drawn from experience, so it's not... You know, it's not short fiction. Um, but I take that as a compliment, I guess. <laughs> Just over here at the right-hand side. She'll have to say something useful. Okay. Before um, How the Light Gets In, was that your first finished novel, or did you have that infamous drawer full of unpublished, you know? Yeah, but it wasn't a drawer, it was a toilet. <laughs> it got flushed. Yeah, I did. I wrote a novel in seven weeks when I was... Um, pretending to be a lawyer <laughs> during my articles year in a law firm. I wrote a novel in seven weeks in, a, in an attempt then, um, misguided and wrong, to win the Vogel because I thought that, was, uh, that would be kind of rightly heaven and that's what I wanted more than anything else in the world at that time. Um, so I rushed off a novel um, in seven weeks and it was really bad, like really bad. But it was a nice kind of um, practice run, a sort of warm-up. And I think the only way to find out if you can write a novel is to write a novel and to do it and to take, let it take its time and it will take time. So that, that was like a, like a practice run, but not, not a, a really a one in earnest because it was only seven weeks. But How the Light Gets In was my first real attempt. An extension of that, in your creative writing teaching, what do you try and convey to young aspiring writers, first-time writers? Are you telling them that it's all milk and honey down the road, or are you just mean to them? I am, um, I'm pretty um, uh, hard on... I mean, really kind of... Um, there's, there's some, the, the, the standard of um, students we have at the, the Centre for New Writing is quite high. I mean, I have to have a first-class degree before they come to us and they have to submit a folio to get into the course. So the standard's quite high, but it, it surprises me how many um, young writers uh, think that it, it, sh it should be able to write very quickly, that, it, that there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an, um, an old and persistent uh, misconception that um, if, you're, if you're a good writer, your first drafts or early drafts will be very good. If you're really talented, what, what first hits the page will be inspired and, and fantastic. Nothing could be further from the truth. I um, think that what separates really, really good writers from mediocre ones or even the good ones is an ability to, to revise and to rewrite and to see what, when it stinks and when it sings and to know that difference. So this is that, that I sort of, I'm pretty kind of strident and strict on that kind of impatience. And, and there's a thing going on at the moment which is unfortunate, which is that um, uh, aspiring young writers in the, sort of during their apprenticeship want to speed it up. So they post blogs and put their stories on websites and then that kind of encourages that kind of group hug 
kind of mentality, so that they're all kind of getting praised by their peers, saying bullshit about, you know, the kind of nice, polite things people say to each other when someone has a blog and says, what do you think of my story on my blog? Oh, it's fantastic, you're amazing. And they come to me and I'm trying to critique this shoddy shit that only took three hours to write when it should have taken three months. And then they say, but on my blog, I got this great feedback. And then I... Wow, you answered the mean question so well there. That's fantastic. That's, uh, Any bloggers in the audience who want to put their hand up now? Because uh, that would be good. There's... I'm making enemies quick smart. Yeah, no, good work there. Good work. Now, there is a hand down here. Thanks, Michael. Um, in the book, there's a moment where Patrick refers to one of the other prisoners, and he's attending one of those quote-unquote stupid creative writing workshops. Just following on from your last comment and question, can you perhaps give us some insight into what it was like to teach creative writing in a prison and perhaps compare that to your experience teaching it at university? Ah, uh, well. <laughs> the, the, prison, the workshop in the, in the prison was um, really strange. This is a ca strange way. It's a Category A high-security prison. And there were three or four men serving life sentences, murder, murderers, a couple of embezzlers they were less interesting, a lawyer who had embezzled a lot of money, actually was a, as a barrister. Um, and then I wanted them to write about their last day. I set a writing exercise where they had to write about their last day of freedom before they, they came into the prison. And, they, and I asked them to write um, a story in which um, it was truthful, except that it was, contained one lie. And then the other prisoners had to identify the lie. In, in the exercise. And I hadn't ever thought about using that in, my, in the creative writing teaching I do at the University of Manchester, but I've since used it, and it's a fa fantastic exercise. And I kind of, I came to it because I wanted them to tell me what they were in for, because I couldn't ask them the question directly. I'd been told by the governor, I couldn't, don't, Mar Maria, whatever you do, please, you know, d um, just for your own safety and, and, or, and ours, don't be asking them what what they're serving time for. So it was my way of getting out what they were serving time for. And then, and then, uh, and they, all, then they were happy to, to tell me. And uh, I could tell, we haven't time, but there's some s f fabulous stories. But one uh, prisoner had his arms folded and he said, you're so smart, you know, tell me this, you know, how do I make a toasted sandwich when I don't have any toaster in my cell? And I had to guess, it was a guessing game, and it went on and on. I said, I oh, know you've got a radiator, you put the bread on the radiator and melt the cheese. No, no radiator. I'm on basic. It's just got, it's just got a toilet. It's called a three metal cell. Metal toilet, metal cot, and metal table. That's it. So I went through this Q&A, this friggin' interrogation with him. I had to work out how the hell he could make a toast sandwich. He goes, oh, I'll give you a clue. I'll give you a clue. You're so smart. You're not picking this up very quickly. Oh, oh. <laughs> you're, a, you're a lawyer, a successful writer, but you can't work on that. Okay. Um, give me some more clues. He said, all right. This was, um, it happens on visiting day. I can make toast sandwich on visiting day. And I just couldn't. And I bet there are people in the audience who are good at lateral thinking. L visiting day, that's the day he can make a toasted sandwich without any electronic devices in his cell other than what would be made available to him on visiting day so he could look nice for his visitors an iron. So he gets to use an iron on visiting day. <laughs> toasted sandwich. I would say and he I should put it on his blog, but I think that that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> but I didn't figure it out. And I, it sort of haunted me. It still haunts me that I didn't figure it out. And he thought I was an idiot. <laughs> you should be in here. What are you doing? I should be out there. I'm a fucking I'm a smoke. <laughs> you're so smart. You're out there and I'm in here. And I thought, yeah, <laughs> pro probably that's true. I thought it's a fantastic logic puzzle. You know, when you, you fail to get something like that and you think, oh, I, you know, I thought I, was sort of, I had half a brain, but I don't, after all, have even wow. half a brain. Because you couldn't work that out. <laughs> Disappointing. And then if you, get che if, you, if, you said that if you got cheese on it, he'd be screwed and then he'd be attacked and he'd be beaten to, within an inch of his life by the other prisoners because then they'd get sprung for using it to make toast. It was fantastic. I think we've got time for one more question. And it, please don't ask, how do I you know, make a casserole without any implements? <laughs> because we'd be here for far too long. Maria clearly isn't equipped to answer those questions. <laughs> uh, just here, oh, there's a couple, so we might just squeeze the last two out. 
The language in the book is quite simple. Is it always simple, or do you start off with the more complicated version? Yeah, I, I, and, and with this book I did, it was mu there were many more kind of... Um, it was much more affected in the early drafts. There were many more flourishes, more showing off, and that, and that really is the was uh, was a stu stupid stupid thing to do so i went back i went returned to my um my first and now only mission which is to write the most unadorned pared back prose i possibly can verbs and nouns and make the writer completely invisible and yet achieve an effect that's the point and one last question here. The hand was up. Um, you mentioned that this third novel, um, you based a character on a chapter from the book Life After Life. How much did you use from the book Life After Life, that particular chapter about that person? Yeah, I used... Um, he was a young man, so 1920, so close to Patrick's age, and a lodging house. So it was a, he was... Um, uh, his circumstances were much more kind of, uh, he was sort of more down and out. So unlike Patrick, who's sort of middle class, quite privileged, who's, who's running away from that life to something um, else. In, in the interview um, in question, this young man who went into the adjoining room, so I used that. But in here, um, obviously, Patrick knows his victim and it's, it's a bit more um, provoked than in the, the interview upon which this is based. What else did I use? There's, there's no seaside in the, in the original story. Um, uh, that's it, really. It's just that the, the, the lodging house, that kind of setup, that scenario, and then the man in the adjoining room. But he didn't know in the, in the real story, in the true story, he didn't know the other man. He simply went in there to kill him. I, completely un, unbidden, no reason. So Except that they uh, suspected he'd stolen something or something like that. I can't quite remember, but there was some kind of... Um, he got an idea that he'd done something to him, but he hadn't, I don't think. So not to ask you to give the game away, obviously, but uh, book four, is the starting point a story or is it a concept like lying for carrying me down? Is it, what's your starting point? Uh, the starting point is no. Nah. No. Not even specifics? Mm. A real-life event, a concept, a character? Uh, no. Okay. Real, no. I'll get it out of Because it just... No, I'm a bit superstitious about... Yeah, no, it's... Reasonable. Um, it's going to be based loosely again on a true story, but that's all I'm going to say. That's all yeah. I needed to hear. Yeah. This book, uh, loosely based on a true story, is an extraordinary novel. Uh, it's called This Is How, and Maria M.J. Highland will be in the Readings Bookshop signing copies. I encourage you all, if you haven't already read it, to go and buy a copy. If you have already read it, go and buy a copy. M.J., I'll sign it. Please thank Maria Highland. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.